Hello, and welcome to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and in this episode, we're going to be discussing a topic I call The Crisis is Here, What Comes Next? Now, this, this conversation has a lot of data points. Uh, many of them are visual. So, for example, if you, you stumbled upon this on our medium.com or you're seeing this on YouTube, um, the video that will follow contains a lot of visual guides. If you're just listening to the audio, it's not a problem. I have linked uh, all of the sources to the visual uh, guides that I'm providing, all the data sources, um, on my website. That's ronrivers.com, and you can always just search for this essay, uh, and it will list everything there. If you're seeing on the YouTube channel, it'll also list there. Uh, I just can't list the sources in the podcast description. It, it becomes too long. Uh, but you, the, the central prediction that we're going to make today uh, is that the economic crisis, uh, as of you know, August 2nd, uh, 2020, is now at the ledge of the cliff. And I believe that the data is showing us that we're about to fall off that cliff. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that, why I believe that, uh, what I believe might come next, and, uh, and what we can do about it, and what, how we should be thinking about this crisis. Uh, because I think it's, it's much more real than we understand at this point. I don't think we've really felt the, the ripple effects. Uh, and we'll get into why in a bit. So as always, thank you for tuning in to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. Data trends are suggesting that the economic crisis is reaching a tipping point here in the United States. If my predictions are accurate and reach the threshold, there is unlikely to be any feasible plan for recovery for a significant number of Americans. Instead, we'll likely see sharp increases in poverty, crime, food insecurity, and violence. We'll explore these statistics to prepare ourselves better to fight against the tide. 11,697,000 people are estimated to face eviction over the next four months, according to an analysis by advisory firm Stout Rissius Ross. 4 million in August and September of 2020. The timer for this housing crisis began on Saturday, August 1st, with the federal eviction moratorium's expiration. Several reports indicate that landlords are getting ready to start mass evicting their tenants. And as a CNBC image that we use as the data point illustrates, there seems to be a higher concentration of risk in the states with high urban populations, or they are relatively poor compared to other states. Now, some state governors have gone beyond the federal government mandate and extended eviction freezes. As we can see from the map, the distribution seems to align with political ideologies. Uh, evictions will primarily hurt the poor, with a weighted distribution towards poor people of color. The result of these evictions will be significant spikes in homelessness throughout our country uh, during the pandemic. It's not a stretch to estimate that these events will correlate with rising death tolls and infections here in the United States. Now, according to data obtained by the Washington Post from Yelp, permanent business closures now outnumber temporary ones. As of mid-July, 55% of the 132,500 pandemic-era closures on Yelp are now permanent. Many of these businesses are small consumer-facing companies, such as the local escape room business, a small restaurant, bowling alleys, and more. And while the trends may not look like much at the moment, the correlation in this data indicates that we're on the precipice of a freefall. This economic hardship will add significant stress to the current eviction crisis. Many of the people barely staying afloat will lose whatever hope they were holding on to. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis July 30th, 2020 report, the United States gross domestic product, often called GDP, dropped 32.9% the worst performance in recorded history. Now to put that in greater perspective, peak unemployment during the Great Depression maxed out at 24.9% in 1933. Now I don't really believe that GDP is an accurate indicator of the health of a nation. Still, the United States corporate controlled Congress and media often tout it as a measurement of well-being. The report tells us that there can be no instant recovery. The gap is now too deep. Whenever recovery does begin, it will be slow and tedious. This information is essential to understanding because it gives us insight into the challenges ahead. With economic activity shifted to this degree, the increasing homelessness population, or those with their heads just above water, will not have easy entry into new employment. 
even if we could snap our fingers today and, and cure COVID-19, the recovery will be long and slow. Before the pandemic, 69% of American families surveyed reported less than $1,000 in their savings accounts. It's no understatement to say that the decisions made by our federal and state government leaders will be devastating to the lives of millions of Americans. Now, this economic crisis exacerbates an existing stagnation problem in the United States. In 2017, the New York Times did a comparison reviewing graduates with technical majors, bachelor, master's, and PhDs, and the employment opportunities available within these verticals. As the graph from the New York Times indicates, except for computer science, there is a significant disparity between the amount of qualified workers and labor available. So this compounds the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. Many of these young individuals will now have mounds of debt that are inescapable. Uh, student debt in the United States is one of the few types of debt immune to dissolution through bankruptcy. At this moment, student loans are a cruel and crippling policy that targets both class and generation, a political arrangement that employs people to support the suppression of another. To have education be contingent on wealth increasingly divides the haves and the haves nots. It is antithetical to the American ideals often parroted, but highly aligned with American actions over the past 50 years. Our systems stress and oppress the majority with artificial barriers to entry, so that those at the very top of the economic power and prestige pyramids can maintain their status. The result is the active hindering of the potential of so many to preserve antiquated social orders. Now, not everyone's going to suffer, uh, and we're, we're probably going to notice a trend. Uh, the burdens of poverty are spread disproportionately among generational lines. Um, and this is to say nothing of race, uh, because that is obvious. There's tons of data on that. Uh, but this is specifically about generational lines. The baby boomers have organized society in such a way that the wealth is perpetually transferred upwards to those to who have while denying opportunities for younger participants within the system. This is true at the local municipal level uh, through affordable housing prevention up to the federal level where most of our lawmakers are baby boomers. The pandemic brings the opportunity to solidify wealth concentration in the United States to degrees previously out of reach. As the poor and middle class struggle to realign their efforts and understandings in this new world, the existing wealthy will only further concentrate their holdings and ride out the storm. The baby boomers and their now adult children will use the opportunity of the crash to buy up depressed assets for fractions of their present costs. We are now witnessing the most substantial contribution to expanding class divisions the United States has ever experienced, the result of which will reverberate for decades. What's next? Now, there's several potential possibilities we can explore using the present as a point of departure. One key takeaway is that the understanding that happenings like the crisis we are experiencing are not isolated events. They create ripples in time that will continue to impact people well into the future. If we rely on electoral politics to solve our present problems, I fear that there is no hope for redirection. Joe Biden and Donald Trump both serve the same masters to varying degrees. A Joe Biden victory will diminish some of the overt racism and authoritarianism at the federal level but too little to stop it as an ideology. He will do nothing to address the systemic oppression baked into our laws and institutions because blind justice requires a reimagining of what wealth is and how we distribute it. As we learned on June 18th, 2019, when Joe Biden told his wealthy donors that, quote, nothing would fundamentally change if he is elected. The patriots in our streets right now continue to be the best course of action for demanding change, but Congress shows nothing but contempt for these demands. Those with power and wealth have no issue spreading violence and terror, as we see with the mass police riots and brutality throughout the United States. Last week, they took a recess without moving forward with an extended support plan for Americans, many of whom are on the brink of financial destruction. At this point, elected leadership is acting in bad faith attempting to sneak military funding into relief bills. The question remains, how long can this multi-course of action last? Now, some moments give me hope. Recently, protesters have begun to demonstrate outside of the homes of elected officials. 
I temper that hope with reality, knowing that the significant majority of humanity abhors violence, creating no mortal fear for those in power. They wield their organizations of terror, and we persist through the abuse. But how long will increasingly desperate people allow wealthy elites to concentrate power while ignoring the majority? If history is any indicator, not very. Here we see an inherent conflict with a transcendent pathway forward. If we replace a systemically violent organization and people with violence, do we not become the same in the process? A peaceful transition of power can and should be the ultimate result of critical mass protesting. But at what cost? Every indicator suggests that no point before November 4th will be better than this one. No matter which possibility manifests, we're unlikely to see the degree of action necessary for our circumstances. The Trump administration has dismantled our federal government, the best technology we have to deal with the national and global crisis. There is a pandemic raging, and misinformation campaigns have deeply diluted people. The national debt ballooned in wealth transfers to the rich. Automation ensures that the means of production are only accessible to a privileged few. And our alternative to Trump is a man with no will to change the corporate order. What exactly are we winning back? Now, with all this talk of economic disaster, it's easy to forget that we're ever closer in, to an environmental crisis that continues to fuel mass extinction events worldwide. A ripple effect of COVID-19 has been dramatic CO2 emissions reductions, the lowest in the past 14 years. Now, if we reignite the machine, we only return to a death march, one that we know will disproportionately impact those without moderate wealth. Social collapse is not new to human history, and if this path is unavoidable for us, we had best learn from it. This moment is made possible by the actions of both internal and foreign forces, and much of the population is ill-prepared for what may come next. The corporation strikes a mighty blow against the United States with these event chains. We don't know where this wave goes, but it's easy to imagine what could go wrong and who would benefit. Now we explore these data sets and possibilities, not intending to spread nihilism, but rather to understand our point of departure. Collective change is the product of individual action. The better each of us understands the reality of where we are and the potential of where we're going, the more prepared we can be to shift direction. Ultimately, I have a high degree of optimism for the future. Struggles are part of our universe and there will be much need for helpers.